Hello and a very good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the Doplexus Master Series with our expert. Our topic for today is malignant pleural effusion, which is a commonly encountered complication for both thoracic and extrathoracic regions in advanced stages of malignancies. The incidence of MPE is estimated to be more than 150,000 new cases each year. Most uh, cases are caused due to breast cancer, lung cancer, and lymphoma. Other causes of MPE include cancer that may spread from the stomach, kidneys, ovaries, and colon. Keeping the quality of life and palliation the primary focus of managing MPE, we have with us an eminent guest today, Dr. Madhu Chandakar, who is the clinical director of the Department of Oncology at Peerless Hospital and BK Roy Research Center. Welcome, ma'am. Dr. Madhu Chandakar specializes in solid malignant tumors and hematological malignancies. She is associated with Vikaspedia, a knowledge portal that is an initiative of the Government of India and has exceptional skills in the field of hematology and pediatric oncology. Her interests include medical oncology, hemato, oncology and hospital cancer registry. She has also been the principal investigator of many cancer-related studies as well. It's a pleasure to have you with us here, ma'am. Um, over to you. Good afternoon. Hi, I am Dr. Modi Chandakar and today I will give an exposition on malignant pleural effusion. Malignant pleural effusion is identified on the basis of evidence of uh, malignant cells in the pleural fluid cytology and or in the pleural tissue biopsy and very commonly diagnosed among patients with different types of malignant tumors. What are the causes of malignant pleural effusion? Around 50% of metastatic malignancy will ultimately develop malignant pleural effusion, to which I will refer from now on as MPE. Lung cancer contributes to nearly 40% of these, breast cancer 25%, lymphoma 10%, ovarian and gastric together contribute around 5%. This is mainly Western data, 15% of lung cancers will initially present with MP and 46% will develop it subsequently. So you can see that malignant pleural effusion is a very, very common and important clinical entity. The different malignancies associated with MPE are given in this pie chart and you can see majority are lung cancers some breast cancers. So together, they almost contributed to a third of these MP. Others are lymphoma, the green one, ovarian cancer, the purple one, stomach cancer, blue one. But there is also an entity known as unknown primary. I will come to that later. That is in this orange part. So primary MP, the commonest primary plural malignancy that is associated with such effusion is, of course, malignant mesothelioma. For approximately 5 to 10% of MPE, we can actually not find any primary tumor. And these cases are described as cancer of unknown primary or CUP, where even with the best of investigations, we fail to clearly pinpoint the primary. So what is the survival in MP? The shortest survival is observed in MPs that is secondary to the lung cancers. You know, lung cancers are very, very uh, a disease with a very, very high mortality. But the longest survival, even with MP, is found in the ovarian cancers, which are very chemoresponsive cancers. In lung cancer patients, the median survival is approximately four months. But we have even seen patients surviving as short as 30 days, depending on their performance status. So what is the etiopathogenesis of MPE? It is possible through various mechanisms. First is thoracic duct obstruction, where the lymphatics gets obstructed. We can even have chylus pleural effusion. Inflammation that increases the vascular leakage and also increases angiogenesis. There can be direct pleural infiltration and there can also be an entity known as the increasing mesothelial permeability. 
depending on all these causes or mechanisms, the color of the crural effusion can be straw-like, can be milky white, or can be even bloody or hemorrhage. So any crural effusion that is exudative must follow the lights criteria. This is the lights criteria, crural protein, more than three gram per DL, plural fluid protein and serum protein ratio more than 0.5, the plural fluid LDH versus serum LDH ratio more than 0.6, and of course, the plural fluid LDH more than two third of the upper limit of normal serum LDH. So this is the uh, well-known lights criteria. So first, we should prove that it is an exudative fluid. So how do they present? Remember, majority of MPE are symptomatic. There will hardly be very few MPE that will not have symptoms. But in certain data, certain series, we have seen as high as 25% being asymptomatic and actually diagnosed by intense physical examination or by radiological examination, but most are symptomatic. So how these MP present? The most common symptom and important one is, of course, they will come to you with dyspnea. This dyspnea is subacute, progressing over days and weeks and may be associated with a lot of chest discomfort or cough. The other symptoms that can be associated are those of malignancy, like weight loss, anorexia, and fatigue, which can also be present. More or less, the symptoms are restricted to the chest, but there may be, there may be some associated symptoms due to the cancer itself. So what about the chest X-ray in MP? If there are clinical grounds or suspecting plural effusion, what do we order? We order a conventional two-view chest X-ray. What is this two-view? The PA view shows fluid volumes, which are at least more than 200 ml. But we can also have a lateral decubitus chest X-ray that we can use actually to uh, show that it is a plural fluid, to differentiate it, plural fluid from the plural thickening. What do CT scans show in MP? CT scans are done when clinically indicated and can detect very small amount of plural effusion. Even around say 10 ml or less of plural fluid can be detected in CT scans. So they are very, very precise and sensitive. And even thoracic out ultrasound that we do can also actually investigate and find out some small plural effusion. So this is typical X-ray of a massive right-sided plural effusion. Here the fluid was serosanguinous, lymphocytic exudate. It was exudative fluid showing a lot of lymphocytic predominance, but we also had a cytology that was positive for malignancy. So this is Typically, how we detect malignant pleural effusion. I would like to discuss a bit on these very large MPE. These large pleural effusions should be drained in a very controlled fashion. That will reduce the risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema. The amount of fluid to be removed by thoracocentesis should be assessed by patient's symptoms, like cough, chest discomfort, or even vasovagal symptoms can occur on too rapid fluid drainage. And we usually limit it to 1.5 liter on a single occasion. Uh, the risk of unilateral re-expansion pulmonary edema has a mortality rate of up to nearly 20% in different series. So we must be very, very careful and do a controlled plural fluid drainage. So re-expansion pulmonary edema is a serious but rare complication. The pathological mechanisms include reperfusion injury of that lung. There is increasing capillary permeability that occurs suddenly. And 
there is also production of neutrophilic chemotactic factors like interleukin-8. So all these together can actually contribute to a highly fatal re-expansion pulmonary edema, which is also very symptomatic with cough and severe dyspnea. I will show some case studies now. Case study one is a healthy woman, MS, who comes with SOB of one to two months duration. The test X-ray is showing massive left pleural effusion, collapse of the right lung, and a nodule in the right lung root. The CT thorax shows massive left pleural effusion with metastasis to the right lung. Let us look at the pleural fluid analysis. It is an exudate. The protein is 3.6 gram. The serum protein is 6.9 gram. So the ratio is more than 5.5. And the plural fluid LDH is 335. The serum LDH is 199. So again, it is meeting the lights criteria more than 0.6. And cytology is actually not contributing to our suspicion of malignancy. It is negative. This is the chest X-ray, the massive left plural effusion. The CT scan showing the collapse of the lung. As you can see, the lung collapse and the mediastinum is deviated to the right. Okay. So this is a typical left-sided malignant plural effusion. Both left lower and upper lobe are actually, they are collapsed. So what is commonly done? We did the same thing. We inserted ICD. And 250 ml of plural fluid was collected and the remaining therapeutic drainage was done. Since our cytology done by a smear method was negative, we tried some other technique. And this was the cell block technique, which had a smear again done with the cell block, which showed the adenocarcinoma. And we could perform immunohistochemistry on this, which showed CEA positive, TTF1 positive, WT1 negative, and calreatinin was negative. This is negative, actually. The microRNA technique was to, used. The microRNA technique showed EGFR mutation, showing exon 19 deletion. So the purpose of showing you this slide is that a Plural fluid can be used like a tissue if we do it with the help of cell block and we can perform immunohistochemistry with the monoclonal antibodies against these markers. We can also perform microRNA technique to show the different genetic mutation like in this patient, EGFR mutation was performed. So this is the glandular structures formed by the malignant epithelial cells. They suggest adenocarcinoma, and you can see the brown cell block IHC done. These brown markers are actually TTF1, which are positive. So the question is, what are the challenges in cytological diagnosis? Commonly, we do the normal smear technique like cytology, which can be negative. Because the diagnostic yield is very low by smear method. <coughs> so this method is also not sufficient to actually differentiate malignant cells versus the reactive mesothelial cells. And there is a chance of lack of the representative cells in this normal smear method because the sensitivity of the smear method is only 33 to 72%. So these are the challenges which we can overcome by some other technique. And what is that technique to improve diagnosis? This is a cell block technique, which increases the sensitivity of detecting such malignancies. The advantage is they can preserve the architectural pattern. So the adenocarcinoma, or the glandular pattern can be maintained in a cell block technique. We can also use it for special stains, pass, etc. 
we can also use it for immunohistochemistry and even perform genetic testing so cell block technique is now becoming more and more popular and the standard of diagnosis so why is it that cell block improves diagnosis this is because we take the fluid and form a gel by cross linking of proteins proteins are agar formalin or heparin so what happens is the cell loss is very minimal as a result not like in a smear normal smears there is so much of cell loss but here the cell loss is minimized very much better the morphological pattern can be identified like the glandular or the papillary structures and of course there is much better antigenicity so we can use the monoclonal antibodies to target some markers which are done by the immunohistochemical method coming to the second case here's a 40 year male who presents with weight loss and sob the chest x ray shows a massive left effusion and a very wide mediastinum so we suspect that there is a mediastinal mass as well as there is pleural effusion and collapse of the left lung bronchoscopy doesn't help us we don't get anything except left bronchial stenosis so this is the picture the very massive pleural effusion complete collapse of the left lower lobe and partial collapse of the left upper lobe there's a huge mediastinal mass nearly more than 17 cm 13 and 12 cm in length and width and we really understand that this must be a very big mediastinal mass we can suspect a lymphoma of course so to continue uh, this case the bronchial smears obtained from bronchial aspiration and the pleural fluid normal smears were inconclusive we did the cell block with 250 ml of pleural fluid it showed lymphoproliferative disorder and we did the flow cytometry the flow cytometry gave the conclusion of b cell lymphoma with cd19 positive cd20 positive cd10 negative cd15 negative and cd30 negative so actually the cell block technique helped us to come to a definitive conclusion so that we could start treatment but not always is uh, cell block conclusive even after intensive studies so here i come to next patient who was a very difficult to diagnose patient the presentation was a huge left sided pleural effusion the ct thorax was unremarkable the pleural fluid did show malignant cells so ct thorax did not show any mass there was huge pleural effusion and the pleural fluid by normal smear showed malignant cells but we did not have any idea that where was the primary so then uh, we had no option but to go for a video assisted thoracoscopy and we did the vats and what uh, we saw was that there were so many multiple pleural nodules that were not visible on a ct scan so from here we took a biopsy and the biopsy was very much conclusive the pleural nodule biopsy showed cord like and nest like cells the immunohistochemistry was conclusive of ttf1 negative but cal retinin positive so there was all the confirmation of a malignant mesothelioma and the pleural nodules were due to that malignant mesothelioma so this shows that sometimes we have to be more aggressive more intensive in finding out the primary and only seeing malignant cells in the pleural fluid will not help us to come to a conclusion of how to manage the patient and here the thoracoscopy the demonstration of pleural nodules and the subsequent histopathology helped us so how do we provide a good quality of life to these patients because we know that these patients are going to have a tough life ahead so the quality of life is important and here is a case study the 55 year aged hypertensive female who presented with non productive cough progressive dyspnea and heaviness in the right side of the chest and uh, as expected there was complete 
wiped out of the right hemithorax and the mediastinal shift was there on her plain X-ray. This was further imaging. You can see that the ultrasound is confirming that there is a presence of huge pleural effusion. And the CT scan shows the effusion with a collapsed lung. So everything is as expected in a malignant pleural effusion. So the needle was put, a pleural aspiration was done, fluid sent for analysis. The initial analysis did not reveal any malignancy even from the cell block. But then since we had a high suspicion of malignant proliferation, we reanalyzed. We reanalyzed these fluid, and this time the pap stain showed clusters of cells, suspicious of malignant cells. The cell block showed looseness of round to oval cells with nucleomegaly, nuclear hyperchromatia. All these were suggestive of the malignant cells in the fluid. And then immunohistochemistry showed that these cells expressed TTF1, napsin A. So we had the confirmation of an adenocarcinoma of the lung as the primary for this malignant pleural effusion. So what I want to really highlight here is that the initial test can be negative, but when we have a high suspicion, we must continue to investigate the patient to come to a conclusion. And here, a second pleural fluid analysis really helped us in coming to a conclusion, though the first was inconclusive. Now, these patients are usually symptomatic. So what is our goal? Our goal is palliation that should improve the patient's quality of life. The goal is to relieve symptoms like dyspnea, as well as we can control further fluid accumulation. That is also our goal. So we prevent the need for re-intervention by some process. We would not like to go on repeating the pleurocentesis. As well, we would like less of hospitalization and less of stay in the hospital. So how to go about it? In this patient, what we did was we did an inspection bronchoscopy and we wanted to rule out that there was no obstruction, endobronchial obstruction. We just found that there was external compression on the right side. So now we were ready for a drain insertion. We did insert a drain in the right pleural space through the safety triangle under strict aseptic measures. But what happened after the drain was a persistent air leak following this drain, intercostal drain. You can see the air fluid level shown here. So next, what we thought was that we wanted to do pleurodesis. And since there was air leak, we had to wait for some time. Ultimately, there was lung expansion. And drain was having only 50 ml of fluid per day. So then we performed pleurodesis with talc slurry. And after 48 hours, the drain was removed. So this is the extreme of that patient. So what is pleurodesis? It is the process of mechanically or chemically induced pleural inflammation to obliterate the area between the visceral and parietal pleura and prevent the accumulation of either air or fluid in the pleural space. So this is the main motto of pleurodesis. What are the sclerosing agents used for pleurodesis? There are several different sclerosing agents that have been used. Most commonly are the talc, tetracycline and doxycycline. But in general, there's a feeling that talc is the most e effective of all the sclerosins. The sclerosing agents can be introduced into the pleural space through the chest tubes or direct visualization by thoracoscopy. Both the uh, procedures require hospitalization, 
but thoracoscopic prothesis needs general anesthesia or conscious sedation, while chest tube approach can be done at the bedside with only oral or parenteral analgesics. What is the mechanism of sclerosing of the pleura? There are many different sclerosing agents that share similar mechanism of inducing pleural mesothelia cell-induced biological responses. These mechanisms include diffuse inflammation with pleural coagulation, fibrinolysis imbalance. There is an imbalance in the coagulation and fibrinolysis. There is also recruitment and proliferation of fibroblasts leading to collagen production. And last but not the least, the release of several mediators such as interleukin, TGF beta, and the fibroblast growth factor. All of these contribute to the fibrotic state that we try to achieve with the help of these sclerosing agents inducing prurodesis. So this patient was followed up. After nine months, there was again reaccumulation of prural fluid. So now the prural fluid kept on accumulating. Three times therapeutic aspiration were performed within two months. So things were uh, really getting bad. The prurodesis now started failing. So what are the complications of such repeated therapeutic pleural aspiration in MPE? There is a chance of hydrogenic pneumothorax. There is chance of pleural fluid contamination leading to subsequent infection and empyema. There is a high chance of pleural fluid loculation. Actually, repeated thoracocentesis may limit the scope for thoracoscopic intervention as it often leads to the formation of additions between the parietal and the visceral pleura. So the other pitfall in repeated pleurocentesis is that uh, sometimes we have to do it on an OPD basis. Why? Because outpatient repeated pleural effusion aspiration alone may occasionally be indicated to control a certain symptoms for those very advanced and terminal patients, like those with a short life expectancy of even less than one month, where you know that anyway she's or he is not going to survive. So we do it at the OPD and ask the patient to go home for further domiciliary, end of life or palliative care. Those with extremely poor performance status, just a bit of plural drainage can actually help them in improvement in their quality of life. And these are certain indications where we would just do a plural drainage without looking into the subsequent uh, complications and give uh, some relief, symptomatic and quality of life improvement of such advanced terminal patients. Now, why is that some patients even with Plural drainage does not seem to have improvement in the symptoms. The first step in the management of MP is to determine all those patients who will really benefit, have symptomatic benefit from pleurocentesis. A considerable number in certain series, even up to 50% of patients of MPE actually may not have improvement in the breathlessness even after adequate plural drainage. This may be due to core morbidity, like some emphysematous or COPD patients, general debility from the cancer, where there is not enough muscle function, the chest wall expansion, the chest wall muscles no longer seem to be that active because of the debility from the cancer, or the presence of certain trapped lung. So what are these trapped lungs? Trapped lungs are those that are not expandable lung even after the fluid removal. Pleural fluid removal does not help in the lung expansion. So there is a high chance that you will not have a successful chemical pleurodesis. The trapped lung can be due to tumor encasement of the lung or endobronchial obstruction with distal atelectasis. These may be the two reasons. And in this case, a tunnel pleural catheter 
is a possible management option. So what do we do? We put a tunnel pleural catheter, which can be kept in the domiciliary care also. Now, once the thoracostomy tube in the pleural space starts draining less than 150 ml per day, the lung gets fully expanded as shown in the chest X-ray. The next aim is to prevent the reaccumulation by pleurodesis. So following the application of the sclerosing agent, the chest tube is maintained for some days to ensure the acquisition of the pleural space. Now the duration or the optimal length of time for which the chest tube must remain is controversial. Some say it's 24 hours, and some say it can be as prolonged as 72 hours. So we in our practice use a medium one that is around 48 hours. So what are the complications of pleurodesis? The most common complications of chemical pleurodesis in MPE are fever and pain. Other rare complications include empyema, local infection, arrhythmias, even cardiac arrest or myocardial infarction and hypertension. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute pneumonitis, respiratory failure and treatment related mortality have also been reported after talc pleurodesis. So whenever we do pleurodesis, we should be very careful about these possible complications, particularly empyema and cardiac compromise that can occur. There can also be serious pneumonitis and respiratory failure. So we should take precaution for this and fever and pain should be adequately managed with the help of paracetamol. So a bit on this talc pleurodesis. If the lung does not expand to contact the pleural walls after fluid drainage, or there is more than 250 ml fluid secretion, even after chest tube insertion, the pleurodesis may fail. A standard chest tube left in place can lead to infection. Talc pleurodesis can fail in such patients. So even if the pleural fluid uh, drainage, that is the chest tube gets dislodged, <coughs> we can have failure of pleurodesis. So there are so many ways that pleurodesis can really fail. You must choose the correct patient. Someone who has more than 250 ml of pleural fluid per day is not a suitable person for pleurodesis. And if you keep the pleural chest drain the tube for too long a time, then you can have infection. And even there can be tube dislodgement. So before pleurodesis, we must do all this checking and then go for the procedure. What is intrapleural fibrinolysis? Intrapleural installation of fibrinolytic drugs like streptokinase, urokinase is recommended for the relief of distressing dyspnea due to multi-loculated malignant pleural effusion that is resistant to drainage. So here is that case study four, where a very advanced malignancy who has failed pleurodesis, and now there is repeated accumulation of pleural fluid. We use a 15.5 gauge one interpleural drainage that is known as plurex or something similar to that, which is introduced in the right plural space under USG guidance. And the thickened plural and trap line are the hindrance for expansion due to previous pleurodesis. <coughs> so to conclude, malignant plural effusion is a very advanced stage. The main goal is palliation because life expectancy is anywhere between three to 18 months. Nowadays in the advanced patient, we are using implantable pleural catheter like Plurex. In those patients who have failed pleurodesis or where there is no chance of pleurodesis, and the 
life expectancy is quite short. With the help of this implantable pleural catheter, we can actually do intermittent drainage. Whenever the patient is symptomatic, we can go for the drainage. And this can be done in domiciliary care. In the patient can be ambulatory. This actually avoids repeated thoracocentesis, which has lots of complications as already mentioned by me. Remember, pleurodesis is not recommended for patients with very short life expectancy. There is somebody who's going to survive for only say 12 to 14 weeks. Amongst chemical pleurodesis, the most popular one that we use in our practice are 30 ml normal saline mixed with talc, say five gram. But before that, we should give it under lidocaine anesthesia. And this is the dosage of lidocaine around three milligram per kg. Cochrane analysis actually analyzed all these different sclerosing agents. And they found that the cheapest one is talc, and this is most favored. And it is a very effective sclerosant. And in our practice, we mainly use talc, but I showed that there are many others also. Fibrinolytics like TPA or plasminogen activator can actually. Uh, have some evidence in loculated effusion that it benefits breaking of this uh, loculation. And anti-VEGF like bevacizumab has shown some interesting results in MPE that is interpleural uh, installation can actually take care of the angiogenesis that is the underlying pathomechanism of malignant pleural effusion. So with this, I come to a conclusion that malignant pleural effusion is a very important entity. We must all be aware of it, not only oncologists, but physicians, palliative care uh, physicians, all need to be aware of this. There are so many methods by which we can really improve the quality of life of these patients. Intrapleural drainage in different mechanisms, different modalities actually will help in symptomatic benefit. Pleurodesis is reserved for certain category of patients and not to be overused. But the mainstay of treatment will be the treatment of the underlying malignancy. If such type of malignancy is chemoresponsive like ovarian cancer, we find that the malignant effusion can even vanish after the treatment of ovarian cancer. So thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, we have a couple of questions for you. So my first question is, what are the recommended treatment options for patients with A, asymptomatic malignant uh, pleural fusion and B, recurrent symptomatic pleural fusion? The treatment option for asymptomatic malignant pleural fusion is uh, observation and trying to find out the primary cancer and treat it accordingly. But if there is recurrent symptomatic malignant pleural effusion, then of course we would like to come to a logical conclusion of blocking the pleural space. And this is done by adequate pleural drainage followed by pleurodesis. Thank you, ma'am. Um, moving on to my next question. What diagnostic and baseline investigations are recommended for patients with suspected or confirmed malignant pleural effusion? In those patients where we are suspecting malignant pleural effusion, pleural fluid cytology is the most important test. But sometimes the normal cytological smear may be insufficient. And in those cases, we take out a sizable amount of pleural fluid, say 250 ml to 300 ml, and then go for the cell block technique, whereby the cellular morphology is better maintained. The chance of picking up the malignant cells is more. And uh, we can even do the immunohistochemistry or genetic testing on such cells. In patients with confirmed malignant pleural effusion, we have to find out the primary. This can be done by the immunohistochemical methods, like if TTF1 is positive, then it can be a primary lung cancer. If calretinin is positive, it can be a primary mesothelioma. 
So in this way, we try to find out the primary, but in case that fails, uh, whole body PET CT scan can also be contributed. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, one last question. So what happens when malignant pleural effusion thickens? Quite often after repeated accumulation, the malignant pleural effusion becomes very thick and it becomes very difficult to draw the effusion fluid by the normal bore uh, intrapleural drainage devices. In that case, if it is very desperate situation, then we have to drain by thoracoscopy. Otherwise, the fluid will not come out. So this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your support and clinical insights on this topic. It was a pleasure listening to you and looking forward to many more such uh, clinical sessions under your guidance. Uh, dear audience, uh, this is it for today. For our upcoming master series, we have a talk planned on the approach to jaundice by Dr. K.V. Girijaja. Uh, so until we see you again, stay tuned and stay connected and have a great evening ahead. Thank you so much.